Welcome to The Growing Concern. Uh, we're going to do a little half hour or so interview with Courtney Scott, producer here at Portland Community Media and also director for Growing Concern. And uh, in the past, she's done the Mad as Hell TV program. And we're all wishing she could get back to it. But Courtney is, uh, she's producing a, a program, video, d documentary actually, on, uh, on animals. And uh, she's involved in that issue. I sometimes wish that I could be involved in just one issue, but uh, Courtney has managed to do that, and, and I it really am happy to see her working on this. But there's something going on here in Portland that uh, folks can lend a hand to if, if they have a mind to. And we've done the uh, animal rights programs in the past. We've had phone calls. There's a lot of support. A, lo a lot of uh, folks are concerned about how we treat our animals. And we're going to talk a little bit about how folks, like I said, folks can uh, pitch in. But uh, thanks for the uh, program. Oh, Good thanks. Good to have you on again. Thanks, Jim. And, uh, we're we're going to be talking a little bit about no-kill shelters here. Right. And the first thought, thought someone says, there's so many animals, and that's the big problem. New to your animals, there's so many of them, that uh, how could no-kill shelter even be a viable thing to do? It's a good question, because it, it does seem like an unsolvable problem. There's pet overpopulation. There's a lot of breeding of pets. Um, there's a lot of, <laughs> you know, there, there are a lot of issues that have to deal with pet ownership or pet guardianship, the way people deal with their animals. But another piece of it is, um, which I found out in investigating for this film, is how shelters manage animals. Um, it isn't really, there's some misperceptions, what, what I discovered anyway, that really there's just an overpopulation problem and there's really not much the shelter can do about it. That's the impression people have. Right. right. Yeah. That's, that's the general idea that people have. And then I came across a book called Redemption by Nathan Winograd. And by reading that book, I started to learn that there is another way. There actually is a no-kill advocacy center that has been promoting the no-kill shelter. And I'm talking about public shelters here. I'm not comparing private, small shelters that just take in so many animals. They can be selective. Yeah. They can say they're no-kill. But really, that's not the same as a public shelter, like Multnomah County Animal Services, for instance, mm -hmm. that is mandated by the public tax dollars to take in every animal that comes their way, mm, strays or however whatever they, they get. So that's what I'm comparing here. And I wanted to find out, is this really feasible? And not just an idea, not just a book, but can it be done? So I went to one of the largest um, animal shelter organizations in the country, in New York City, and found out that there's a working model there. And they are on the road to be no kill by 2015. So maybe we want to look at this little video that I put together that will show people a little bit about the issue and an interview that I did with Jane Hoffman, who's the head of the um, Shelter Alliance there in New York City. The best, the dogs and cats that we love, we're still killing four million a year in this country. those decisions on which ones can be placed back into the community, yeah, which is the majority of them, and then um, ones that aren't, uh, can be placed, are not placed. And what happens to those dogs? Those, those animals are euthanized. One of the things that people d don't understand is when they relinquish their their pet. Unless your dog is, you know, this perfect dog that doesn't show any bad, bad behaviors, most likely it's just going to be housed until it's time to be euthanized. They have a covert pit bull ban that allows them to slaughter wholly innocent pit bulls in huge numbers. Last year there was 1,200 pit bulls came into this facility. Uh, the euthanasia rate is higher. It's about 50% of the, of the pit bulls do not get placed or do not go back to owners. A lower number of owners come to get their pit bulls. When a pit bull comes into the facility, their days are numbered. They were not spending time with them, not socializing them. You know, they, they just stayed in their kennels 
until it was time to be euthanized. I, we had started to talk about the no-kill advocacy group and the no-kill shelters that are illustrated in the book Redemption. So what do you think about that? What do you think about the feasibility of that being incorporated, let's say, here in Monroe right. County? I don't think it's feasible at this at this stage to to um, to start thinking about that. The only time I fault animal control is if they don't embrace, frankly, the, the idea of no-kill because they should be the people who are advocating the hardest for no-kill. While many shelters across the country are reluctant to embrace the no-kill direction, a few are moving forward with it, including an alliance of shelter and rescue groups headed by Jane Hoffman in New York City. In June of 2005, when we got the Maddie's Fund grant, Mayor Bloomberg had a press conference to announce the fact that we were so excited that we had received this goal, this grant, and that New York's goal was to become no-kill by 2015. This is the mayor of the city of New York embraced this idea. Our animal control is part of the alliance and embraces no-kill. I believe in euthanasia in the right cases. I just don't want anybody to get an easy pass. Healthy and treatable is very broad categories for us. It's not, you know, this is not an easy way out. That's why we don't really use the word adoptable because that's so subjective. I mean, what does that mean? Um, you know, we want to have some really more objective, which is why healthy and treatable, if you define them, is a much better way to go. The reason I wanted to do this here originally was because if we can do it here, nobody can say you cannot do this because this is one of the most dense cities, the largest cities in the, in Ameri in the United States. We're probably taking in somewhere over 50,000 animals in our entire system. If, if we can do this, other municipalities can do this. We got approved for the adoption process, and uh, yeah, so I think we're going to take Samson home. Take a look at that. Website, okay. All right, that, that was www.nokilladvocacycenter.org. No All right. Well, you know, there's a lot of different ways to go, but uh, a, a town of a city the size of New York, uh, I don't know how many millions of people. I think it's like uh, 8 million. 8 million people. Or maybe it's 10, I don't know. 50,000 dogs a year, mm -hmm. animals a year. Uh, do they somehow have more funding for this than any other city does? Well, what they did, um, first of all, they got a coalition together of different organizations like the ASPCA, the Humane Society of New York, and different rescue groups. And they went together and they applied for a grant from what's called Maddie's Fund. And this fund is set up to specifically help organizations become no-kill. That's the whole purpose. So they applied for the grant. They got it. And then the mayor, she, like she says there, the mayor of the New York City had a press conference and said, this is our direction for New York City. We're going to become no-kill. Mm -hmm. And our target date is 2015. But like you see, they've already reduced euthanasia from 74 to 39% in like six years. So what it is, it's a goal. You know, it's like trying to reach world peace. You know, you're not going to get there overnight. Mm -hmm. You're not, not going to get to no-kill overnight. But as long as that's your goal, you're going to have a heck of a lot better chance of getting there, or at least getting closer to there, if you abide by the no-kill principles. And they have, the, on their website, they have, I brought it here, the no-kill principles. I was just going to ask you. Yeah, they about. have it. And, and people who want to, or organizations that want to sign up with this, they ask that you sign these, uh, this pledge, basically, to follow these principles. And they're pretty simple. And I'll, I'm going to read just yeah, a couple of them so people sure. know. The principles are shelters and humane groups in the killing of healthy and treatable animals, including feral cats. Every animal in a shelter receives individual consideration, regardless of how many animals a shelter takes in or whether such animals are healthy, um, underaged, elderly, sick, injured, traumatized, or feral. Shelters and humane organizations discontinue the use of the language that misleads the public and glosses over the nature of their actions, such as euthanasia, unadoptable, putting them to sleep, and other euphemisms that downplay the gravity of ending life and make the task of killing easier. Mm -hmm. and, more, and make the public go to sleep. Exactly. A very good point. Shelters are open to the public during hours that permit working people to reclaim or adopt animals during non-working hours. 
This is not happening right now. Mm -hmm. Shelters and other government agencies promote spay and neuter programs and mandate that animals be spayed or neutered before adoption. Now, they do spay and neuter the animals here at the shelter. However, in New York, what they do is they actually have free spay and neuter programs, which they take out into the community. She was telling me how they go into the Bronx or Harlem, and they'll just spay and neuter every pet. Rather than the people having to bring it. Right, rather than having to, so it's accessible. And then also for people who can't afford it, it's free. And they've done a study that shows that the main obstacle to people getting their pets spayed and neutered is their income and lack of accessibility. So they're solving that problem that way. Mm -hmm. So those are some steps that people can take. Well, one of those um, was interesting. You said that they should, uh, what was it, the third one again? I think they um, said that they can't turn down an animal because it's... Right. There's also Regardless the of how, how, what condition it's in, under a, under aged, elderly, sick, injured, they can't kill them for those reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, like we were talking about earlier, there's, earlier, there's the other side of it, uh, like, like all the dogs that uh, Vix ended up damaging, they all found homes. Right, exactly. It's the other side of it. And, and, and you know, they, they are able to, to uh, for some reason, you'll see these ones that go on the news that were found in homes that were abused and all. These are all go out right away. And are they the, the shelters spending more of their efforts to to find homes for these? Well, now those animals I should point out were taken by some rescue groups, like Best Friends in Utah took some, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if that some people stepped up, you know, because it was a famous case. Right. So people with money, I think, stepped up and helped get those animals to rescue organizations. Right. But what it points out to me. And also, this is something that Caesar Milan said. Caesar Milan is known for being a ghost, whis a ghost whisperer. <laughs> I know my program's mixed up. <laughs> the dog whisperer. Mm -hmm. He says that no animal is born aggressive. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're made that way, and every single animal can be trained out of it. Now, I'm not a dog trainer. I can't justify that or say that that's true. I'm just telling you this is what he said, mm -hmm. and he's been working with these dogs for years and years. Mm -hmm. So, and the fact that all of those animals, I, I believe almost every single animal from VIX was re-socialized and almost all of them have been adopted, goes to show that even animals that have been fighting can be re-socialized into being adopted. Mm -hmm. And that it goes against everything that has been happening in shelters. Animals that are fighting animals are just, they don't, socialize them or work with them because they say they can't, there's too much effort involved, there's no one can. I mean, there's a long list, a laundry list of reasons why this doesn't happen. And, and what, all I'm saying is New York City is doing it, so we should be able to do that here in Portland. And the thing about the VIX case, it also goes to show that it can be done. Right. You know, if people exactly. are properly motivated. That with, with VIX, it was a famous case. People come out of the woodwork and took care of business. Well, you know, if they demonstrate the same affection for animals without them being in the spotlight, exactly, it be no problem. Exactly. So that's where our tax dollars and our, our, you know, we're citizens here that support these shelters. We're paying for these shelters. So I think people should be aware of the fact that they are not, lives are being lost that don't need to be. And we here in Multnomah County now have an opportunity to step up and make our voices heard on this issue because Multnomah County just went through a task force where they analyzed how shelter practices are working right now. And now the task force findings, from what I read, basically just focused on how owners or guardians can increase license fees, be more responsible, get spay and neutering, and all those things, while important, are ignoring what the shelters could be doing. There was only like one line in there that said, well, shelters should try to reduce their euthanasia rates. But there was no practical mandate on how to do that mm -hmm. or whether they should do that. So that's where I think we, we have the opportunity now, since they did go through that task review, that task force, and they have changed it a bit since I did speak to Randy Leonard's assistant down in city council, and he mentioned that they have actually reviewed and revised some of their task force findings. One of them was that vet, uh, vets will be required to not treat animals who are not licensed. Now, the veterinarians wrote in and said, wait a minute, this goes against our principles. We can't just not treat an animal because he's not licensed. So they have now since then 
come back and rethought that. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if they've come back and reintroduced their new task force findings after that or not. I'm having a little trouble getting some solid answers. So what I would like for people to take out of this, if they are concerned about this issue, is to contact City Council, Mr. Leonard's office, or Ted Wheeler, who the county is also responsible for the shelters, and show that you're interested, that you would like to see them go in this direction, and come down to City Council and have an opportunity to discuss it. Is there, gonna, is there some uh, City Council meetings scheduled on this issue? Not that I've been able to determine. I've been trying to get that information. Maybe if others could speak up and call City Council and say, we'd like to find out when this is going to happen. We'd like to testify or come down or give some input. Mm -hmm. Maybe they will have some success or maybe the City Council will feel, well, enough people are really interested in this. Let's take the next step. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, it's a greasy wheel that gets, how's that go? It gets to go, it gets the grease. Oh, well, <laughs> something like that. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. That's it, yeah. that's it. Well, so, it you know. Sense. you got to yeah. make noise. And if people don't make noise, then the, then the city council, as is probably the case, you know, they've got to respond to their electorate. Exactly. You know, they, they need to demonstrate a little bit of intelligence and, and, and determine what issues are, are important, aside from the fact that other people think it's important. And to any of them, any advocates on the city council or the mayor about uh, animal rights issues? You know, I, I haven't spoken to the mayor. I would like to do that. That's something I need to do. Um, and I don't know as far, I think, I think they once did a story in Willamette Week about who owns dog, who, who's a guardian of dogs. I'm trying to change my own language. <laughs> it's not, it's not. But um, I'm, I'm sure there are animal lovers on city council. The, the issue is, what do they want to do about it? You know, do they really want, because Portland is known as one of the most dog-friendly cities in the country. I it is, yeah. Now, I really think that, they, they say, for instance, if slaughterhouses were made from glass, everyone would be a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. a I think line, yeah. the same thing would be true of shelters. If everyone saw how many animals are, are killed, not euthanized, killed every single day, I think it would start to make them think about it. Maybe there's something they could do about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I really think it would be t it's time for us as Portlanders who love our dogs and our cats to step up and do the next step and try to at least move in that direction and realizing it'll take time. But we have to at least take that first step. And as, and, and as they're doing in New York, exactly. admit that it's possible. Not only admit it, you know? say that they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And they set up a whole strategy to do it. They have a 10-point program to do it. And Jane Hoffman, the director of that program, I asked her, is more than happy to sit down and talk to anyone here in Portland to explain and help them through the process. Mm -hmm. And I believe someone at Best Friends would do the same. So it isn't like there isn't help out there, because it, is it is, takes a little effort. But one of the things I pointed, and, and actually Randy Leonard's assistant, Aaron, pointed out, they could have a county levy. Very small amount, each individual, each taxpayer would pay cents on the dollar every year. Very small fee. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to get excited about tax increases. But something very small that would help cumulatively to help support this program. And then they could apply for the Maddie's Fund grant in addition. So there's ways to fund it. There's ways. And then the other thing people should realize, euthanasia, I'm putting that in quotes, costs a lot of money. I, I read somewhere on the internet it costs thousands and thousands of dollars. So you're, you're funding something that really maybe you don't support. There could be an alternative to that. Mm -hmm. And it's like everything else. I mean, with any issue, uh, you think about it on the level that, that, that your relationship with it is, but then you start digging into it and finding out layer upon layer of knowledge, things start changing. And uh, you, you, they start changing, as you're saying, in a way that this is possible. You know? and, exactly. And, and uh, if, if, we, if we purport to love our animals, and I'm sure there's an awful lot of animal lovers out there, uh, as you say, Portland is a is an, uh, a very dog friendly and probably cat friendly as well. You just don't see the cats as well. The dogs are everywhere, but you know you don't go out the, out the door and drive down the road without seeing someone walking a dog. And people love their animals. I know that. I I can see that. I don't think that's a dispute at all. It's just a matter of it's like breaking through any tradition that exists in our world, whatever the issue is. Most of us get stuck in some kind of thought pattern. And it's really hard to move past that sometimes because we've been doing it that way for decades. And animal shelters have been running this way for decades. Mm -hmm. So how do you go past that? You have to get through some resistance, first of all. And I think that's true of everybody for, 
for this issue and for every issue. Right, and you know, a, a, a culture, we come out of the Christian tradition that uh, says that, the, that the human beings have lord over everything and that only human beings have souls. Well, you know, we can get philosophic about that, but even aside from getting philosophic about that, thinking that uh, we are so much bit better or different than them, anybody that's ever owned an animal, and specifically with me, a dog, and see the emotional life and the intelligence in the eyes of these animals and how much they respond to love, I mean, they can be totally, uh, whatever Vix did to these animals was pretty horrendous. But uh, some time spent socializing them is the word you use, they can be they can be uh, given out to uh, to uh, families even exactly so you know there's an awful lot of intelligence and and love in these animals and uh, they shouldn't be taken down and just killed because you know uh, people don't want them because it, as you say there's so many ways that could, this could be done exactly and at least all I'm asking for city council and for the counties to take to debate the issue put it on the table let's talk about it let's mm -hmm. move it the this the subject forward. Let's not just say, oh no, we can't deal with that or that's not possible. Because that's generally what you get from most people is, it's just not possible. We can't do it. Mm -hmm. Well here, let's, let's look at it. It is possible. They're doing it in Reno as well, in the public shelter. Let's yeah. put, up the, uh, put up the phone number here, you know, in, in a few seconds and uh, see if folks want to call up, comment, any points we missed, add to the conversation or, uh, or maybe some questions, something we, we quite didn't touch on. Uh, I, that was something I was going to ask. So it's, it's, it's only two cities in the country, Reno and New York? Well, I believe there's one in upstate New York as well, and I think another one in Charlottesville. Is that North Carolina? I, I'm, I can't quite remember, but mm -hmm. there's four that I know about. And I believe San Francisco used to be totally no-kill, and I'm not sure if they're moving in that direction. And I just saw online there was a conference in Los Angeles where there are people down there working to turn Los Angeles into no-kill. And I saw Dr. Elliot Katz from In Defense of Animals speak about it. He, his organization sponsored a no-kill conference in L.A. Really? So, you know, that's Matt's organization. And so I think there is discussion now going forward on that in different cities. All right. Well, speaking of discussion, I think we have a caller. First caller, you're on the air. One quick question, uh, Courtney. Uh, given that our uh, animal shelter out here, I believe, is county-operated, mm -hmm. um, would we uh, necessarily need to pressure, uh, I guess, what, Metro, uh, no. in addition to the city of Portland? Thanks. I'll uh, listen for your answer up here. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for the question. Um, it is actually a county-run facility, but the city of Portland has, is, interacts with it as well in terms of funding. So they both, in, in a sense, work together. The, the county does have jurisdiction over it, and Ted Wheeler is the... Uh, county chair, who would be a good person to contact, and Randy Leonard and City Council. It is not Metro, though. It is Portland City Council. But thank you for uh, helping us clarify that. Mm -hmm. And like you know, like we were saying, you know, let's make a squeaky wheel out of this. You know, let's, right. Let's get some grease on that. And and, it, and if people call up, they'll have to respond to it. I think we have another call. Next caller. Hello, next caller. You're on the air. Yes, um, I've been an animal rights advocate for years. I was a shelter vol and I've been a shelter volunteer at Oakland SPCA, one of the oldest SPCAs in the United States. All right, congratulations. And I have <laughs> never heard anything like I'm hearing tonight. I'm shaking my head. There's mm. three animals for every person in the United States. How can you possibly hope to have no-kill shelters? Thank you for the question. I think that is a, uh, something that everyone asks, and it's basically been the idea that because of the fact that there's so much overpopulation, really there's nothing more that can be done. However, all I can tell you is that I've been to a shelter where they are implementing no-kill. I've seen it myself. So they have reduced their euthanasia from 74 to 39 percent. That's by half. So therefore... It's a working model at this point. It is no longer just a theory. And so whatever numbers are out there or whatever statistics are out there, all I can tell you is just, you know, the website I think was up for a little while. I would ask you to go to that website and check it out for yourself and see what you think. And you can, you're more than um, able to contact the director of that center and ask him more questions. Because what I am is I'm a filmmaker. 
Uh, my film is The War on Animals. I'm here to promote myself <laughs> now. forgot about that. And um, <laughs> so therefore, I'm really not as in-depth on this issue as others. And I would suggest highly that you contact the No Kill Advocacy Center because you ask a good question, and I think you should deserve a more in-depth answer. But all I'm saying is I've seen it work, and that's where I would like to say let's go forward and discuss it. Put it on the table. You may not be familiar with the nuts and bolts of it, but you're familiar with the fact that uh, people are doing it, and uh, those nuts and bolts, you know, can be figured out. Exactly. The first thing is willingness. I mean, you have to at least say to yourself, oh, here's something that's possible. And I know it is new. I understand. And thank you so much for calling and pointing that out, how new this is to people. But there are, believe it or not, quite a few shelter activists in this city who've been working on this issue for quite a long time. And so they just uh, haven't gotten quite the, the publicity, perhaps. And if that's why I'm on tonight, is to try and get this issue a little more publicity. And the other thing I wanted to point out is, not only is this helpful to the public and to the animals, but to the shelter workers. I mean, these people that work in these shelters are having to do these horrible jobs of killing animals. And they're human. They don't want to have to do this. I empathize with them. And I think this will help them as well. Mm -hmm. You know, because the shelter workers I've talked to say they have support groups because they're dealing with such emotional baggage every day of their life. Say what they have to do to themselves so, in order to do their job. Exactly. So I empathize with them. Mm -hmm. Another call? I think we have another call. Next call, you're on the air. You know? Hello? Hello, you're on the air. Okay, I just had a, a comment about that. Uh, you, you get too emotional. Uh, I myself could not do it. I, I, I couldn't work in a, uh, <laughs> in a kill shelter or a non-kill shelter. I couldn't do it. I don't want to do it, and they should get paid a lot more. But I had a question. Uh, what's the big difference between a kill shelter in a non-kill shelter, uh, do the, the shelters that don't kill, do they ever stop taking new dogs? Uh, and if the, uh, the no-kill shelters, no, I mean if the kill shelters, do they ever kill dogs that can be adopted? They're healthy, but they have not been adopted. And I, I'll, I'll take my, my, my answer off of here. All right, thank you for the call. Yes, thank you for that question. Yes, there is a dis very distinct distinction between a no-kill and a kill shelter. But I want to make very clear, we're talking about public shelters here that do have to take in all the animals. A, a private shelter that says they're no-kill, but they give their animals, don't take in all the animals, or they take their animals that are hard to adopt and give them to the public shelter who then kills them, that is not the same. That is why there is a guiding principle right online that people sign on to to follow the no-kill guideline. Um, animals are killed uh, who are adopt adoptable, who are healthy, who could find a good home. A lot of times there's not enough space, or this is the reason that's given. Um, there's volunteers that you saw, one that was on my little video here, who, who volunteered at the shelter and saw this happen on a daily basis. Um, it particularly happens to large breed and so-called aggressive breeds. So it does happen. Yes, kill shelters, shelters kill healthy, treatable animals. And it would seem to me one of the first things that could be done is uh, get, get the, uh, the grants or the money in order to expand and be able to hold more dogs or more cats. Right, and also what, what they do though, what Jane explained it as, they're like a marketing department. They get the animals in and then they branch them out to the various divisions within their system. Mm -hmm. They have a very sophisticated system while well, they have transport set up. They can take the animal to around the city, and that's a big deal in New York. Um, they get online. They, they, they have different rescue organizations that can deal with food aggression or, or whatever the issue is mm -hmm. that the dog is dealing with. Mm -hmm. And it's also important with cats to support um, trap neuter release. And that's a whole subject. We may not have time to go into all that. But basically, there, there's ways to save feral cats as well. It just seems to me that this is totally possible to do, and, and the, the, the callers are bringing up really good points that, that uh, you know, everybody's astounded that this could possibly even be considered that it's, but, you know, ex expand the amount of room, and, you know, being in the media, as, you know, you do documentaries and, and, and public access TV, I have seen animals on, I think, you know, local broadcast stations that are up being, up for, for uh, adoption, and, uh, these cities, you know, Reno or, or, or 
these different places. They could take advantage of public access TV and get a lot of, of these animals out there. That, exactly. Because you see these animals and you see them sitting there and licking your hand and, and uh, with them big eyes and everything. And you realize, wow, you know, there's people out there that could probably give this dog a, a home. I think that's a very good idea. It's a good way to, to uh, use access. That's what it's for, really. Exactly. Public access, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's specifically for the community to make the community communicate to itself. And what more should it communicate to itself than the, uh, the absence of homes for, for, uh, for pets? Because probably all these animals, unless they're very young puppies, were somebody's pet at one time, right? Isn't that where they come from? Most, a lot of them are strays. A lot of them are picked up. A lot of people drop off their animals. And I'm not saying people shouldn't be responsible, more responsible. That's absolutely true. That's one, it's like a tripod, there's three legs. Mm -hmm. The guardian owner situation is one leg of that. And the, the shelters are another, the rescue organizations are another. So it all has to work together. And uh, what do they do with the animals when they, after they've uh, killed them? You know, thank you for that question, because that's a good question. We don't know. I mean, really? they could be rendered um, for pet food, for instance, or I, I don't know. I, I shouldn't even say, but one thing that an attorney I talked to said, there is nothing on the Oregon statutes saying that it's illegal for pound seizure here in Oregon. In other words, they could take animals from the shelter that maybe they can't adopt or whatever and sell them to labs medical labs oh, for that's experimentation. Horrible. That's horrible. I, if someone can tell me whether that's not true, they have a statute they can show me. I tried to find out. I, I did not find a statute on, on the Oregon books forbidding that. So that's one possibility. So if it's not forbidden, then it's legal. Yeah. And it would be a way to make money. Mm -hmm. We don't know. I mean, it's kind of hard to, to find out these things. You'd have to be an investigator with a camera and, no. and go there after hours or something and find out what do they do with the animals. Mm -hmm. The lack of transparency so, is alarming about it that. It is. That, that is an issue. That's something I had never thought about. I know I've 50,000 a year and, and uh, half of those are being uh, put to death in New York City. That's 25,000. You know, that's what, 2,000 a month, something like right. that? That's a, that's a lot of animals. And according to shelter activists here, they're euthanizing something like 60% of the animals here. And I, that was a while ago since I've checked those numbers. Mm -hmm. Pit bulls, more like 80%. Right. Cats, much higher. But overall, the numbers are very high for mm -hmm. euthanasia or killing. Well, all right. I think we've probably covered right. it pretty good. So let's, uh, let's just kind of recap a little bit. Uh, you think it's a good idea for people to call city council? Yes. And let them know. Randy Leonard is, is in charge of that issue. All right. And, uh, you know, it's easy to get onto the, uh, I forget the website um, for, for the city, but you can get the Leonard's page and, and uh, leave, some, leave an email. A phone call is always better. Letters are even better than an email. But, you know, he gets, he gets a few hundred emails. He's going to have to pay attention That's to That's right. You know. Let I'd be me, delighted with a few hundred emails. That would do a lot. It well, really would. Let, let, let them know that this is an issue. You know, Portland has, has made it into national news, I think, about being so, so bike friendly, so dog friendly. And, uh, you know, we, we, can't, we can't be putting these animals to death if we're dog friendly. Exactly right. And that is, that's generally what it is, is dogs more than, more than any other animal. Well, they actually get rabbits. Um, rabbits are, is another issue. I don't want to leave that out. And cats. But I think... The, the issue with um, socialization is specific to, to dogs. I don't know if it can socialize a cat too well. Yeah. They might be able to. There are going to be cat people out there who know more than me on that. But, well, there's, there's, but there's definitely an issue with aggression for, yeah, dogs, for dogs. And they are put down for that reason. All right. Definitely. Okay, Courtney, thank you for coming. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate this having the opportunity to speak about this. And this is something that's been below everybody's radar, but like, what, like we've been talking about, it's everybody thinks it's, it's a done deal and nothing can be done about it. Well, you know, there's, there's, that's been said about a lot of things. And, and, and someone stands up and, and says, hey, wait a minute.